empire, but also entertain a couple of anecdotes and puns, uh, which I'm trying to always boost my, <laughs> my book with. Um, so I'll start the talk by describing the book project at large, um, along with my kind of methodological theoretical interventions. Uh, I'll then dig into a specific chapter to think about infrastructure and sustainability, not only in terms of materials, but also in terms of construction labor. So uh, the title for this talk comes from the title of my book, um, A World Cast in Concrete, How the U.S. Built Its Empire. It's under contract with the University of Chicago Press. And so the book traces how the U.S. cemented its political power through the manufacture and dissemination of concrete. I start in the Lehigh Valley of Pennsylvania, where the industry took root in the second half of the 19th century. I then follow the industry's expansion to the U.S. South in the first half of the 20th century, imperialism in the global South in the second half of the 20th century, and contemporary neocolonialism in outer space. So the chapter I will share with you today, uh, chapter four, centers on a construction program developed at the Tuskegee Institute in Alabama, but through the case study, I really think about the broader connections between the US South and the global South. Together with historians like Tori Olson, Nancy Clark, and others, I think about how the US South has been a kind of internal colony within the United States, and in some cases performed as experimental grounds for deploying various infrastructures and forms of development to the global South. So I'm really interested in how the empire manifests not only in obvious foreign policy situated in spaces of externality, but also how the empire is developed, negotiated, and refashioned on domestic soils. This approach comes from my American studies training and background, uh, which thinks not only about the US and the world, but also the world in the US. Despite my chapter focus today, I'm excited to talk about any part of the project in the Q&A. So very broadly, my book shows that we cannot understand US capitalism without grasping its materiality. And I argue concrete is crucial because without this material, the US would not have been able to construct its ports, roads, buildings, oil drilling platforms, plane landing strips, and a host of other infrastructural components that make empire logistically possible. The cement plant was therefore a crucial technology of world making that enabled the creation of surfaces for modern military engagement, dissemination of equipment, and, erection of use, or, and extraction of useful minerals. Much like the US's involvement in oil extraction in the Middle East fostered new forms of political governance, the US's introduction of concrete likewise created new material, social, and political futures. So without concrete, the US empire would have taken a radically different shape. In that vein, concrete is especially useful for thinking through the material dimensions of racial capitalism. Unlike other building materials, for example, steel, lumber, or even plastic, concrete is a mixture, a recipe. So I'll expand on that in just a little bit. Concrete's nature as a recipe therefore gives it a unique flexibility that allows the material to adapt to different social, political, geographic, and environmental conditions. In other words, while some building materials might falter in particular local contexts, concrete can find its way in any landscape. So it can be manufactured at small, local, as well as large industrial scales. It can be uh, chemically rudimentary or extremely sophisticated. It can be very, very cheap or quite expensive and always mobile. Due to these qualities, concrete became the principal medium for capitalist material accumulation, and it is in concrete that capital found its temporary resting place before circulating again. So this is not to say that concrete itself is a racist material, or that by eliminating concrete, we can do away with racial capitalism. Rather, I argue that our decision to use concrete in the construction of nearly everything opens the door for capitalist relations rooted in racial difference and labor exploitation. It is important to note that this is not limited to the exploitation of people, but also of animals, land, and other categories that become abstracted in service of capital. 
So when we start to engage with land through the lenses of utility, profit, and development, we preclude other egalitarian modes of thinking. Centering materiality in the study of racial capitalism also brings forth the built environment itself. Typically a backstage actor, the built environment is crucial for understanding how racial capitalism is made concrete. So my book therefore examines concrete not in the context of a particular city, building, or architect, but instead seeks to understand concrete in the world. Uh, many folks in this, in this audience might be familiar with concrete through the architectural style of brutalism. We have a local example here. Um, it was essentially a mid 20th century, late 20th century style that produced uh, large, after gov often government or public uh, buildings in exposed concrete. While my book does not discuss a particular brutalist architect uh, or a set of buildings uh, in depth, it does explain how concrete ever became an option for this scale of construction in the first place. So throughout the project, I also push against the common <coughs> assumption that concrete is an inherently modern material and instead show how concrete, its production and use, is embedded within the broader histories of slavery, colonialism, imperialism, and climate change. Especially central to my work is reframing architectural production as not only that which happens in cities or on construction sites, but also in rural landscapes, in transportation and in storage, and within human, non-human, and land bodies. For me, architecture is not a set of objects, uh, but instead a complex web of systems whose creation and maintenance generates unequally distributed costs and privileges. So my research approach um, to concrete is inherently interdisciplinary and it speaks to a variety of fields, including architectural and urban history, science and technology studies, history of capitalism, and the US and global context. In addition to traditional archival research, at 17 public, private, and institutional repositories I conducted ethnographic research um, in cement manufacturing towns in Pennsylvania, Alabama, Mississippi, and Michigan. I've also conducted dozens of formal and informal oral histories with cement workers. Um, some of these conversations constitute the first archive of cement occupational history at the Library of Congress. So oral history for me is a form of subversive knowledge uh, that it privileges overlooked historical perspectives. Uh, I know some of you are working on these kinds of projects here as well. So in the context of architectural history, I'm specifically referring to detailing the unexamined experiences and contributions of materials manufacturers, construction and maintenance workers, and residents. Personal narratives also create unique opportunities for power analysis, whereby we can challenge normative white and Western forms of expertise. In other words, expanding our notions of what types of human and beyond human bodies uh, participate in creating and maintaining our built environments. Through my documentation of worker experiences, I therefore show the embodied history of extractive capitalism and the social and environmental injustices that it produces. So before I dig into the chapter, I want to clarify a couple of terms. So whenever we speak of concrete, and cement, we generally consider the two, the two to be the same. Yet cement and concrete in the end are not the same thing. So cement is a material made by processing limestone. We first extract it from the landscape, then crush it and burn it and crush it again to produce a powder so fine, in some cases it passes through a sieve that water does not pass through. So to turn rock into this kind of a powder, we have historically relied upon coal. Um, however, more recently, <clears throat> we have switched to burning used tires and trash to reach the nearly 2,600 degrees Fahrenheit necessary to create this man-made volcano you see on the right. So this burning process is necessary to manufacture cement. In other, way, in other words, there's no way around it. We have to do this. Um, in turn, cement manufacture contributes enormously to climate change. Uh, the cement and concrete industries produce more CO2 emissions than both trucking and aviation industries combined. Concrete, um, in contrast to cement, is not a material but a recipe that includes cement along with water, rock, sand, 
and other desired ingredients um, from glass to plastic, you name it. According to some statistics, concrete is now the second most consumed material on earth after water. And a recent article from the journal Nature showed that concrete now makes up an enormous portion of anthropogenic or human produced mass, which now exceeds all biomass on earth. So concrete's historical legacies are a mixed bag. On the one hand, the material has brought us modern creature comforts we can no longer live without in the shape of buildings, highways, dams, and other forms of critical infrastructure. But on the other hand, our aggressive use of concrete will lead us to our own extinction. So throughout the project, <laughs> I'm grappling with this complicated um, contradiction. So I open up my chapter titled Black Concrete Power with this image that I took in 2017 when I traveled to Georgia to locate this public art piece and monument. The three rock mounds sit in a small and unassuming overlook park off Highway 17 in Brunswick. After rain, the forms are submerged in water and become barely visible. Uh, but during the dry season, they reappear in all their glory. They are large and uniquely shaped, and when the sun hits them just right, the small shells embedded within them glisten in the light. The three formations appear to be at home in the marshes, but they are not actually original to the site. The mounds are a public monument titled Marsh Ruins, created by Beverly Buchanan in 1982 to recollect and memorialize the concrete landscapes built by enslaved people in the US South. Instead of using the type of concrete we are familiar with today that I just described, um, a mixture of cement, sand, aggregate, and water, enslaved workers used tabby. Like concrete, tabby is a recipe-based material, but instead of burning limestone to extract lime, which is the key heating agent, workers burned oyster shells. Local folklore tells us that when Spanish colonizers landed on the shores of the US South, they discovered large piles of oyster shells deposited on beaches. The European settlers presumed the mounds were trash piles and brought the shells inland to burn them and create this type of concrete. However, contemporary archaeological research tells us that the mounds themselves were architectural structures carefully built by local indigenous peoples, including the Timucuas and the Guale. The European settlers therefore pushed out uh, or murdered indigenous peoples and then destroyed their cultural sites to erect their own buildings. It's important to note that tabi construction is not a Spanish building tradition, but rather a technique that they learned from the North African Muslims during the Middle Ages. So unlike contemporary versions of concrete, which remained stable even when poured extremely thin, tabby had to be poured quite thick. Um, and this was to compensate for its lack of tensile strength and very bulky composition. The mixture was made up of lime, water, and sand, along with whole oyster shells, which are generally the size of a human palm. Spanish settlers and later enslaved workers built extensive wooden formwork to support the massive pores. Thanks to the substantial thickness of tabby architecture, they remained forever embedded in the landscape. Centuries of climatic and social activity slowly disintegrated the mixture, and tabby structures lost their structural coherence, now appearing as ruins. Early 20th century tourists imagined the tabby formations to be remnants of opulent homes, of European settlers, or habitats of African ghosts, people who were forever imprisoned on this land. Beverly Buchanan grew up in this landscape, and through marsh ruins and other projects, she explored how built environments and their production contain the histories and memories of builders and users. Her work asked, how can black people connect with their ancestors not only through photographs, which were often inaccessible to the rural poor, but also through building materials and construction practices? How can architectural materiality and labor create experiences of intergenerational and even transnational belonging? And how might construction quite literally pave the way for decolonization and provide spaces for freedom? Here I'm thinking together with political science scholar Elizabeth Anker and others um, who think about um, expanding and reframing freedom as not a monumental act, 
but rather as small moments generally deemed mundane or even unvaluable. In other words, engaging with historic building cultures can produce small freedoms defined by fostering non-hierarchical mutuality, sharing the world side, uh, alongside others, and eradicating exploitation. In my chapter, I'm also aligning myself with scholars like geographer Judith Garney, who wrote about how African rice growers and their descendants adapted the crop to maintain traditional diets and cultural ties. Similarly, sociologist Monica White showed that although overlooked in histories of the civil rights movement, black sharecroppers, tenant farmers, and domestic workers were key agents for social and environmental justice. I argue that like food systems, building systems also have this capacity for cultural and historical continuity. By bringing tabby and concrete together, I highlight the artificiality of familiar architectural binaries like modern and vernacular, global and domestic, which have isolated tabby and concrete as distant and disconnected building technologies rather than analyzing them as continuous and interrelated traditions. I therefore join architectural historians like Mabel Wilson, Irene Chang, and Charles Davis II, who critique architectural history as a settler colonial project rooted in the promotion of white futures at the expense of all others. By putting the two types of concrete into conversation with one another, uh, I also consider whether by changing manufacturing hands, concrete had a chance at a different historical trajectory, one defined not by US imperialism, but by global anti-colonial struggles. By focusing on the Tuskegee Institute's establishment of its low cash cost housing program, which taught rural black farmers how to deploy concrete in farm construction, the chapter treats concrete as a dialectical medium. So it was capable of serving both freedom and empire, independence and slavery, life and death. So one of the best preserved examples of tabby architecture are the 32 slave cabins at the Kingsley Plantation in Florida. They are built in a broad arc, some thousand feet, feet south of the main house, uh, and slave workers built them using tabby for structural walls and clay brick for fireplaces. The construction process, which included collecting oyster shells and burning them to extract lime, scooping sand, gathering water, and mixing the ingredients together, was reminiscent of other forms of domestic labor. It required skills like collaboration, adaptability, and creativity. And slave workers learned such expertise through other domestic activities like cooking. So as a construction technology, Tabby therefore blurred the line between building and making. On the exterior, Tabby buildings presented a rough surface with pointy shells protruding outwards and emulating knives or, or other sharp weapons. Um, they essentially threatened to uh, scrape unsuspecting passerby. And slave workers typically covered the walls with plaster to create a smooth finish and painted them white. The interior rooms were likewise decorated with personal possessions and artifacts that reflected the residents' creativity. Especially common decorations were newspapers. Some people believed that by decorating home interiors with written text, residents could keep away the haints, uh, which were essentially these evil spirits that had to read every word um, on the wall before they could practice their magic. Others covered their walls in newspapers because the text symbolized a future with access to freedom of movement and education. In coastal states like South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida, oysters were plentiful and constituted the crux of the local diet. For enslaved workers who were tasked with creating tabby buildings, oysters presented a deep bodily familiarity. The mollusks provided the energy necessary for working in the fields, raising families, and feeding them. In addition to arming workers with proteins, vitamins, minerals, and antioxidants, um, the oyster shells themselves came in handy as eating utensils. Enslaved people fed their families by placing milk, soup, or other rations uh, in a large wooden tray on the floor. Family members then used the oyster shells to scoop the meal into their mouths. Buildings constructed of tabby therefore reflected the entirety of enslaved workers' lived experience, from communal working, building, and cooking, to tasting the salty flavors of the ocean. The tabby cabins were therefore not buildings as objects, but buildings as components of the holistic web of life. At Kingsley, a surprising number of tabby structures survived decades of neglect. Some of these buildings are sufficiently intact, 
allowing visitors to imagine human occupancy. But others have slowly disintegrated with time as tropical rainstorms and hurricanes crumbled the mortar into dust. In turn, the fallen oyster shells created small mounds of their own, and in some cases, the local vegetation took over the tabby ruins, creeping into the tiniest crevices to find fertile grounds. Disintegrated tabby structures have therefore fostered their own ecosystems, supporting the survival not only of people, but also of small organisms and plants. Through its unique materiality and building technique, tabby architecture preserves the ghosts of past residents and serves as a container for their experiences. Historian Tia Miles argued that, quote, ghosts are a method of history making, a cultural process by which we create, use, and understand history, end quote. Particularly in the US South, where the ghosts of slavery continue to shape the present and the future, it is crucial to confront the many different material and immaterial legacies of this racial politics. Much like recipes for meals that provide insight into the flavors um, of people long gone, architecture too has the capacity to reveal communal relations, cultural practices, and lived experiences. So in the beginning of the 20th century, when concrete as we know it today enter the rural landscapes of the US South, it was there for both a new and an old material. However, its utility and promise were clear. Concrete could help black farmers to diversify their agriculture, gain independence from the white construction materials market, and connect to historical construction methodologies. Especially important was rethinking basic farm infrastructure. To grow new types of plants and livestock, farmers had to construct new facilities with modern feeding and cleaning technologies. In addition to integrating electricity and hard concrete surfaces, they adapted new patterns of rural domestic life. Agricultural experts organized exhibits and disseminated various manuals that taught farmers how to essentially turn their farms into factories. These experts taught farmers not only how to improve the layout of their operations or how to integrate scientific management techniques that improved productivity, but also how to see themselves as businessmen. Um, so here the farmer on the left um, looks pretty smug uh, as he's carrying a bag of cement as if it were essentially a bag of money. So the Tuskegee Institute first introduced concrete into its, um, to its students in 1903 through a course on concrete roads. And only eight years later, students were mastering how to mix, proportion, distribute, and test concrete. A 1906 photograph of Tuskegee's 20-year anniversary proudly displayed concrete sidewalks under construction. Students and alumni marched in the middle of the dirt road as the concrete mixture dried in front of their eyes. The smell of wet concrete indicated progress uh, and the transformation of the institute from a regional agricultural college into a nationally recognized institution. Soon thereafter, in the 1910s, scores of new buildings on campus from a student dining hall and a dairy barn to a power plant, featured concrete in their foundations and walls. Prior to concrete's advent, uh, the Tuskegee Institute was renowned for its production of red clay bricks. Um, and they were used across Alabama uh, and beyond. Students quarried the campus landscape for clay, forming, drying, and firing the material uh, to manufacture the distinctive brick. They then used the brick to construct campus academic and residential buildings. Um, so brick was essentially a really critical commodity that Tuskegee sold uh, both to black and white builders in Alabama. So if we look at a brick masonry classroom uh, from around 1920, we can think of it as a kind of exhibition room of construction expertise. First of all, the classroom is housed in a spacious, modern, and clean building with large windows and lampshades covering light bulbs, a very impractical decoration in an otherwise functional space. The large group of students are shown exercising a range of skills from various brick binding techniques to decorative columns. The young men avoided eye contact with the camera, which Anna Goodman and Maura Lucking have shown uh, was a common trend in construction for photography at Tuskegee used to display the submissiveness of student workers. The students are supervised by faculty who are easily identifiable by their professional attire and large blueprints in their hands. A Dixie Company 
um, calendar hanging near the window emphasized that the brick making and laying operation was a business first and a classroom second. Tuskegee depended upon its students' labor power to sustain itself. In that vein, the elevated balcony with a door to a private room on the second level recalled the centrality of the factory overseer, or in the case of the US South, the planter surveying his fields from the porch of the big house. While brick was a lucrative commodity, concrete was what some builders described to be a bottom feeder material. It was accessible to every farmer and amateur builder. It was therefore the perfect medium for transforming local rural built environments from simple wooden cabins to permanent homes. Advertisements published in local Alabama newspapers pushed farmers to rebuild and modernize their homes. So the advertisement on, on the left says, Quote, what good things can a man teach his children in a house like this? What proof of love can he give his wife to outweigh his lack of love, which is shown by having her live in a place like this? <coughs> what excuse can he give his community for being willing to live in a hut like this? If you live near such a place, ask the man of the house these questions, end quote. So Tuskegee collaborated with community leaders, including clergymen, to teach local farmers about the transformational potential of concrete. Preachers made announcements from the pulpit and preached sermons on the spiritual and moral significance of the home. Although slavery separated and destroyed generations of black families, Tuskegee leaders believed that a modern concrete home could literally rebuild it. They shared labor, the shared labor that concrete demanded also had the capacity to bring families and communities together. So unlike brick, which required material resources, skilled labor, power, and technology for manufacture, concrete necessitated cement and materials already available on the farm. Concrete therefore promised black farmers an opportunity to transform their lives and those of future generations with little more than dirt. In 1946, using grant money from the General Education Board, Tuskegee developed low cash cost housing, also known as self-help housing, and so the low cash cost housing project proposed that farmers could erect permanent homes on their own by utilizing the free labor of their family and community and locally available materials to manufacture concrete blocks in winter time during the agricultural off season. At the beginning of the experiment, Tuskegee faculty tested various material options, including timber, rammed earth, and soil cement mixtures. These options were problematic because of the high cost, requirements for specialized facilities, and skilled construction labor. Program leaders finally settled on concrete, which offered savings in both money and in labor. Tuskegee noted that, quote, on most of the eroded cotton farms in the South, deposits of sand and gravel can be found in ditches and creeks anywhere, end quote. So farmers only had to purchase cement, and one bag of the powder produced 20 blocks of concrete. The, the concrete blocks. So to keep the construction process simple and accessible, Tuskegee faculty focused on producing a basic yet well-designed element, which was the concrete building block and its formwork. The formwork was a simple frame, and it could be built by, quote, one man with crude carpentry skills, end quote. Tuskegee leaders articulated that, um, or they calculated that one farmer could construct enough wooden, form works, uh, for, wooden forms in one day to hold 100 blocks. He could then mix and pour 10 blocks per hour. And with a month's worth of practice, he could lay 160 blocks in an eight hour day or 20 blocks per hour. Tuskegee's concrete block compared well with commercially available alternatives, yet cost significantly less to manufacture. And the only skilled labor that farmers had to hire was for the laying of the corners, roofing, wiring, plumbing, and chimney building. The project proposed a unique technique of wall bonding that included a critical three-inch airspace in between the blocks. This ensured that individual blocks were thin, cheap, and easy to manufacture, yet produced sturdy homes appropriate for the local climate. While concrete low cash cost housing equipped farmers with blueprints for attaining modern comforts on a rural farm, the buildings were by no means free. Even though farmers could rely on locally available materials and the labor of their families, they still had to accrue debt to cough up the nearly $2,000 necessary for the average four-room modern cottage. So considering that the median home price in Alabama at the time was over $16,000, Tuskegee's low cash cost housing 
provided a very affordable solution. So today, uh, the cost of such a house would translate to about $35,000. So despite all the savings, for many rural families, their new concrete homes represented years of saving um, and planning. Photographs of educational workshops um, showed young men laying, learning to lay the concrete blocks using trowels. Um, so this image you see in front of you features six young workers pouring concrete blocks into homogenous formwork uh, as another man in a trench coat and a hat directs their labor. Unlike the theatrical stage of the brick classroom, this workshop took place in an unfamiliar and even domestic looking space. Again, the young workers are not making eye contact with the photographer. Yet the camera is positioned low and close to the floor, and it encourages view viewers to inhabit the, work, the bodies of the workers and see clearly what types of labor was involved in building low cash cost housing. In other words, farmers from all over the US South, regardless of their literacy, uh, could read the image and understand the process involved in concrete mixing and, and pouring. Thanks to the clarity of visual communication, farmers could imagine themselves performing this labor and helping their communities embrace this new material of modernity. Another photograph shows Tuskegee's agricultural leaders congregating outdoors and inspecting the completed concrete blocks. Once again, it is clear that the workshop along with the manufactured product was meant to be consumed by black farmers. Unlike the brick classroom, this image showcases an organized but by no means professional workshop. And the concrete blocks are not displayed to present a neat and pleasing appearance to illustrate the skills of Tuskegee workers, but instead are stacked vertically to simply preserve ground space. Everything about the concrete block, from the construction techniques to the workshops and their organization, address the practical needs of black farmers in their communities. Even the centrally positioned pulley cart appears to anticipate that upon the conclusion of the demonstration, workers would return to the site to move the concrete blocks and continue the construction process. On the interior, low cash cost homes presented environments of unparalleled comfort. They featured individual bedrooms with built-in closets, well-equipped kitchens and private bathrooms. Large windows included um, in every room of the house ensured that the living space was naturally well lit and thus saved money on electricity. A heater positioned in the center of the house made sure that the homes were warm in the winter. Two large porches situated on opposing sides of the building introduced passive cooling techniques and provided additional cross ventilation during the hot summer months. With ample land to spread out horizontally, low cash cost housing was limited to a single level to save on cost, including on staircases and overbuilt foundations. Homemakers decorated their new domestic environments uh, by putting to work various discarded papers and fabrics to add color and whimsy to the home. Uh, Tuskegee leaders experimented with movable and interchangeable walls, compact furniture and storage units, and new panel material for floors and ceilings. While this form of affordable housing improved the material conditions of rural farms, the model failed to address how these new domestic environments would transform the lived experience of farmers. For example, how would the modern kitchen, now segregated from other living and working spaces, transform the role of women on the farm? And how would domestic maintenance labor, like cooking and cleaning, be divided among family members? Despite the incomplete social picture of the low cash cost housing, the project gained national media attention and financial support. Tuskegee President Frederick Douglass Patterson commented that such housing projects, quote, extended the Institute's usefulness to the community and to the South at large, unquote. Meanwhile, the US Housing and Home Finance Ag Agency noted that low cash cost housing was not merely an experiment, but a catalyst for the swift transformation of rural and suburban dwellings in the region and beyond. So Secretary of Agriculture Charles Brennan visited one of the demonstrations and therefore offered an important stamp of approval from the federal government. Tuskegee's um, low cash cost housing was an important and early voice in a broader conversation about architecture not as a complete object, but rather as a process in which the, the residents are critical co-creators. The concrete block was a, way, a key form of financial aid 
uh, that the U.S. disseminated in a kind of global game of political chess. And in that sense, the U.S. South performed as a kind of testing ground for possible forms of development in the global South. So USA to Puerto Rico, Jamaica, Bolivia, and Peru, for example, provide our residents with money to purchase $300 worth of construction materials per household, including a block making machine and a cement mixer. Residents came together to manufacture the building components and together construct individual family homes. In 1952, a similar effort took place in Korea where refugees received lumber, nails, and cement rations to build over 7,500 residences. So over a period of three years, nearly two million refugees were resettled into compact concrete homes. This residential concrete, uh, this residential concrete infrastructure received a mixed reaction. It was not a hit all the time. In Ghana, for example, residents invested, um, or sorry, in Libya, residents preferred the locally carved limestone uh, as an alternative. Um, it, it was quarried using traditional hand cutting techniques and um, performed better in terms of uh, heat insulation. So historians like Daniel Imerwar and Nancy Kwak have shown that community-based approaches to development were not new and instead existed as part of the broader project of US empire. Yet despite this mixed legacy, the concrete block continues to dominate residential construction on the global scale. Um, one of the better known contemporary examples is Via Verde, uh, designed by Elemental in Chile and built in 2010. Some of you might know this project as the half a home a house that earned the architect Alejandro Ravenna the Pritzker Prize in 2016. So Via Verde provided affordable homes to residents of Constitucion who were displaced after the 2010 earthquake that destroyed 80% of the city's housing stock. The houses are simple two-story two homes split in half. One side is move-in ready, while the other is an empty space waiting to be filled out by the residents. While deemed extremely innovative and cutting edge, Via Verde is really an outcome of a much longer history of self-help housing. So the history of cement manufacture, dissemination, and use is literally embedded in the surfaces we walk on and touch every day. But in order to uh, put these histories and materials front and center, we really need to look beyond designers, beyond buildings, or even cities. Tuskegee's low cash cost housing is an important case study for understanding the emergence of self-help um, housing in the first half of the 20th century in the US. By tracing the long material history of the region and bringing tabby and concrete together, we can challenge notions of modernity and expand the types of workers who participated in the history of concrete. In other words, it was not strictly a medium rooted in northern cities, industrial factories, and scientific laboratories, but instead encompassed much greater geographies, both in the US and overseas. Indeed, only by expanding our lens of analysis can we begin to understand the reach of the US cement and concrete industries along with their politics. So to conclude my book, um, sorry, won't offer a solution to climate change <laughs> or even a roadmap for ridding our environments of concrete. Um, however, I hope it will equip readers with a theoretical framework for th questioning how we have learned to depend on concrete and paradoxically how we have learned to not see it. Only by grasping the continuities between concrete and slavery, colonialism and climate change, can we begin to read power and conflict in the built environment. Only by grasping the agency of materials, people and landscapes, can we empower ourselves to work towards a future less concrete. Thank you. Thank you.